Today, uh, we turn in our Bibles uh, to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Now, you can follow along in the pew Bible that you can find in front of you in your, um, in your pew, or you can look in your bulletin. It is printed there for your convenience. If you have a smartphone or other device, I invite you to follow along and make any notes that you would like to about our reading. This comes from, again, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and it comes at an important time in the life of Israel where this scene takes place. So I invite you to hear these words and imagine what it must have been like for Isaiah to have this kind of vision. In that year, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. If you're anything like me, all of a sudden your keychain has these little plastic paper fobs on it now. And often they have barcodes on it. Whenever I go shopping, I have this barcode on my keychain that donates money at the grocery store to my kid's school. And then, for me to get into the YMCA, I have to have this little keychain here with a barcode on it to scan so I can get inside. If I don't have this, I can't get in. I don't remember having these too often before about the year 2000, do you? I don't remember having barcodes that I could scan in places. Yet around 2000, 2001, 2002, all of a sudden, people started getting membership cards to put on their keychain from their drugstore or from their grocery store and things like that. It started happening about that time. Well, I was working in the summer around that same time, the early 2000s. I was working in the Appalachian Mountains at a Christian camp in the Methodist Church, Lake Junaluska. I was working in a, a facility that was for students, for youth. They would come in and we had pool tables and video games and they got to come and relax and have something to do in the midst of their conference that they were attending or if they were local children and youth, they would come and just have a place over the summer to get involved so that they weren't sort of running all over the town of Waynesville and the surrounding areas. So I was in, in ministry there working with these students and there was a track that would go around the lake And it was about two miles long or so, and people would come from all over and walk around that track, and from time to time, people would find their way into this youth center. And one day, I had a lady show up in the midst of one of our little sessions. We were having a Bible study, and walked in and stopped and told all the students there and myself that she had been walking around the track and looked up into the sky, and in the clouds, there were like four horsemen like from Revelation, and they were, it was a sign that God was about to come and destroy the earth. And then she said that she started noticing at the grocery store that people were scanning their wrists like they had the mark of the beast, and they were scanning it at the grocery store. And I, I could tell you that the youth were very disturbed by this conversation. And I wanted to say it was probably one of these things that you saw at the grocery store, but she was convinced that she had this vision and it was showing that it was the time for the end of time. 
I'm afraid that sometimes we think of visions when they come to God, when they come to the church, we think of visions like that, don't we? Visions seem disturbing. Visions seem like something unnerving is about to happen, like this lady. She thought that this vision was the sign that something else was coming. But if you turn into the Bible, if you turn to scriptures, you'll find that often visions are not disturbing. Visions are often signs that God is about to do a new thing, that God is going to open up a new possibility. It's sort of a foretaste of what's about to happen. This happens time and time in Scripture. Joseph had his own visions. If you remember from the book of Genesis, he had his own visions about what would happen. And those visions got him sold into Egypt by his own brothers. And while he was there, he was able to interpret the dreams, the visions of the Pharaoh. And that itself assisted Joseph to be in the right place at the right time to let his family, who had sold him off, be saved during the time of great famine, a long famine. His family and the people of Israel would have been in jeopardy if God had not started with those visions opening up a new possibility. Then think about Moses showing up in the wilderness and seeing that burning bush and having the voice of God speak out of it. This vision was the beginning of God's people being liberated from that same foreign land, Egypt, and being delivered after 40 years in the wilderness. Even in the New Testament, this pattern seems to occur. In Acts chapter 9, it was Saul, remember, who was persecuting Christians, who was walking along the road and was stricken down and became blind and had this vision, a voice, speaking to him, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And that vision begins the process of converting this man, Saul, into Paul, who becomes the person who evangelizes to the Gentiles, The people in Turkey and Greece and Rome become Christians because of that moment. Because at that time, Christianity was staying within the nation of Israel for the most part. And Paul and others began these missionary journeys spreading the gospel elsewhere. In the very next chapter, Peter himself has visions where unclean foods foods the good Jews should not eat fall down from heaven on this giant sheet. And he's been told, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter is reluctant and says, no, I will not go. I will not put unclean food in my mouth. But he's convinced at the end of that vision that he should be receptive to what God is going to do. And the very next scene in Acts chapter 10, three men come to Peter's door after he has this vision And they say there's a man who has had a vision himself. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman centurion. He wants to talk to you. And again, this opens the doorway for the gospel message to go out to different people, people that they may not have heard before because of these visions. So you see, hopefully, that visions in Scripture often have the purpose of saying something important is about to happen, something significant. God is about to act in a new and different way. And often the person who is receiving the vision is the first person getting clued in that I am going to have to have some sort of leadership in helping people understand, change, adapt, and be faithful in the midst of what's happening. So if we can apply that understanding to today's scripture, we can say that because Isaiah is having this vision, this grand vision of God, something significant is about to happen. And there's one clue in verse 1 that gives us understanding as to what might be happening. The very first words in chapter 6 are this. It was the year that King Uzziah died. Now, you have to know a little bit about Jewish history to understand this. Egypt was a major power. The Philistines became a power for Israel. But eventually, after the time of David and Solomon, there was a time where the northern kingdom and southern kingdom of Israel split into two different kingdoms. The northern kingdom had its capital in Samaria. 
And the southern kingdom of Judah had their capital in Jerusalem itself. And they were divided, but because there were another, no other great powers, no other great enemies in the area, both Israel and Judah were able to thrive. They were able to become large and influential powers in that small area of land near the Mediterranean. And they were also able to amass riches. Solomon and David started with these riches that were collected in the temple, but it continues for quite some time. This was at least the reality that was going on up until this point. This is about the year maybe 745, 746, during this time in which God's people were split into two kingdoms and things were going relatively well. But the date of the time in which King Uzziah died was a time in which things were about to change. Things were about to change, and Isaiah was going to be needed. He was going to be a prophet, someone preparing the way. He would be God's voice speaking to the king and speaking to the people. You see, things were about to change because these foreign powers were about to become more powerful. The Assyrians were rising into power, and after them would come Babylon, and after them would come Greece, and after them would come Rome. There would be a time after this point in which great powers would come and threaten these two kingdoms. In fact, the Assyrians would come and wipe out the nation of Israel and take them all the way into captivity. And these other powers would become large enough and come and pillage and threaten Israel and Judah. And all that wealth would have to be used to pay off these armies so that they would not come and destroy them. The wealth would just go slowly out the door. Everything was about to change for God's people. A new reality was about to set in, and this vision is marking the time of change, and it would be Isaiah who would have to step into this very difficult situation and help guide the king and help guide the people. In the vision, in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is told who is going to go. Who will be our voice? And after the experience of being forgiven and having the coal touch his lips, Isaiah says yes. Now I don't know about you, but stepping into this situation that Isaiah is stepping into, all of the uncertainty, all the fear, all the terror that would be coming their way, it's not the kind of situation I would like to be called to. It's probably not the situation you would like to be called to either, is it? To step into a situation where you're going to have to speak on behalf of God in a grim reality... It's daunting. It's frightening. How in the world do you speak with courage and hope? Well, this vision is not only an opportunity for Isaiah to understand what's about to happen. It's also an opportunity to prepare and to empower Isaiah to be the voice of God, and to do the will of God. So first, this vision creates an opportunity for Isaiah to be prepared for what he's about to do, for this great and difficult calling. The very first thing that Isaiah mentions as he's standing there before God, before this throne, with all the seraphim flying around, The very first thing he mentions is that he has unclean lips. He says he has unclean lips, and he comes from a people with unclean lips. John Wesley, who helped start the Methodist Church we talked about recently, he explained that Isaiah was saying something like this, I'm an unclean branch on an unclean tree. Now what does he mean by unclean? What does he mean that his lips are unclean? Well, the best that scholars can say is is that when Isaiah is taken in this vision and he sees the seraphim and they're flying around, they are using their mouths, their lips for one sole purpose, and that is to praise God. Just like in our opening hymn today, they're saying, holy, holy, holy. 
they are praising God with each and every breath. And it's almost like Isaiah walks into this vision and realizes that with his own mouth, with his own lips, he has been saying things that are not so holy. Or, or maybe that he has not taken every opportunity to give God thanks and blessing for all that is going on in his life. His lips are unclean because they have been doing and saying unkind and possibly even impure things. He hasn't always used his lips for the blessing of God and the blessing of others. Have you ever had a moment where you realized that you've allowed your mouth and your lips to do unholy things and to say unholy things and to tear down instead of building up? I have a friend who grew up in Piedmont, Alabama. And in that small town, everybody knew many of the people there. But they didn't always know what was going on in their lives. My friend was a young person, and they, uh, they knew a lady in town called Crazy Dot. Now, everybody called her Crazy Dot. Everybody. And he and his friends would always talk about Crazy Dot, and they would use her as jokes in their conversations. They would gossip about her. And she often drove around town in an old, beat-up car with no rearview mirror. And that was the source of all the jokes as well. When my friend grew older and he heard what really happened in her life and what affected her, all of a sudden he began feeling guilty about all the gossip and all the jokes. For this woman, Dot, had lost her husband and all of her children to illness and death. She was the only one in her family left. My friend realized at that moment all those hurtful words that were spoken <clears throat> to get a laugh, maybe to make themselves feel a little bit better by putting down someone else, all of those words that were spoken were in ignorance. They were hurtful. They were not honorable. They were especially not holy. With all that goes on in our world, with all the issues that we face, with all of the gossip, with all the television, with all the media, we are encountering unholy things so often that sometimes our minds become clouded themselves and we get sucked into that. And we don't always use our own mouths for the blessing of God and the blessing of others. We get sucked into demonizing and destroying. Maybe Isaiah was like us, with unclean lips from a people with unclean lips. But when he encounters this vision, when he's before God, God does not let what historically his mouth has said be an issue. But the angels, the seraphim, take the burning coal off the altar and they touch his lips. Now that would be pretty painful. But you have to understand there's symbolism behind that. The burning coal was to purify his lips, to blot out sin and to remove guilt. Fire was understood to have refining properties. Like when silver is obtained by burning off all the impurities and removing that dross, rem re uh, leaving only silver behind. Fire was understood to have a purifying Quality. And so touching the lips with a coal was meant to burn off all of those unclean, unholy things, to remove those, to blot them out, and to sort of have his lips reinstated for the work he is about to do. So Isaiah, in this process of having his lips refined, is ready to take on the challenge he is prepared. But the second thing that this vision helps us understand is that Isaiah is empowered. Isaiah is empowered to do this work. He is not simply asked, go do it and left alone. God is not going to see what Isaiah makes of this. But God empowers him. And this is something that God does time and time again in Scripture. 
Who will go for us? Who will speak for us? Who will do the work for us? Well, we mentioned Joseph. God sent Joseph into Egypt and never let his side, left his side. God sent Moses into Egypt to liberate the people and God never left their side. It says that God was uh, like a pillar of smoke, a pillar of cloud in the sky and was with his people each and every step of the way. God sent Paul and Peter to spread the good news, to grow the kingdom of God, to invite in as many different people as could be brought into the kingdom of God, and God was with them each and every step of the way. When God calls someone, God empowers them with his presence. God does not send us alone. When God calls us out on his behalf, he walks the distance with us. There's an old saying that goes like this, God does not call the equipped, but equips the called. Meaning that when God calls us, when God calls us into these situations, he is with us each and every step of the way. Now today is Trinity Sunday. It's that day that we set apart to acknowledge that God is one God, but that there are three expressions of how God is. Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. And this has been confusing, and I'll write a little bit about this in your bulletin. I invite you to read that later. It's been confusing for some people, saying, how can you believe that God is one, but God is three persons? This doesn't make sense. And yet at the same time, this opens the doorway for what we're about to understand here for Isaiah and for you and I. If God empowers you and God is with you each and every step of the way, if God is one God up in heaven removed from us, how can this be? But if God is at once Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's job is to be present here in the world, empowering and being present with each and every one of us, whether we need encouragement to do what God is expecting or we need the presence of the Holy Spirit to Help us as we're mourning a loss. God's radical presence is with us, and that happens because of the Trinity. The presence of God for those who are called brings peace and confidence. Because God is not just up in heaven, away from us, waiting to see what we make of things, but God is radically right here beside us and in our hearts. God empowers us by never leaving our side. Isaiah will have the preparation and he will have God with him as he leads all those through a difficult time. If you're called, you feel a calling in your life. Whether it's to be in some kind of ministry, to start a ministry, whether it's to be a better person, a better father, a better mother, a better student, whatever it is that you feel a calling, that you want to bless God and others through your life, never forget that God has the opportunity to prepare you for that and that God empowers you with his presence. The good news is we are never alone. Amen and amen.